Good morning. I would like to give you a well, uh, warm welcome to a, uh, the start of this session. And I have the uh, honor of actually introducing the first speaker. Uh, the program today uh, with the speakers will have each speaker giving a 15-minute talk with a five-minute question and answer session. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I'll go ahead and introduce Donald. Uh, Donald is a, uh, Clark is an expert in e-learning. He has won many awards for his uh, design and strategy for implementing e-learning. He has been involved in many implementation of e-learning programs, both in the private sector as well as uh, the government. His involvement in higher education uh, has also uh, been uh, uh, quite extensive in the implementation of web-based e-learning and online programs. Uh, just, I just met Donald uh, this morning and he told me an interesting point. He said, David, I've got an exciting thing to tell you. He says, I don't actually work. He says, I'm an entrepreneurial, and I love to give money away for people that are doing projects in e-learning, and there's no uh, involvement of shareholding. So though, uh, Dr. Chan, this is a good opportunity. I present Donald Clark. Thank you. missed out there is that I'm actually from Scotland and if you know anything about Scottish culture you know that it's the last thing on earth I would do would be give money away for free. <laughs> <laughs> what I'd like to do this morning is talk uh, to one particular theme here and I'll call it the Napsterization of learning and by that I mean what happened to the music industry which is overnight because of one piece of software, a smart little 18 year old kid called Sean, three months in his bedroom, changed the world for every, everyone. This may be happening in education. I'm not sure but it may be happening because we are certainly witnessing the decentralization, the democratization, the disintermediation of education. So let me have a look at that topic this morning. Open for debate as they say. And I'm going to go back in time here on my first slide. This painting was painted in 1340, before books. And it's an image, the first recorded image really in painting of a lecture. And this was at the University of Bologna, Europe's first university. And you'll notice the guy at the lectern talking to the people down here. And in fact, <laughs> much like this lecture, nothing has changed obviously in 700 years. It's almost the same color as the lectern on the stage there. In fact, these rows look remarkably like the rows 700 years ago, even down to the people down the side here. Pedagogically, this is absurd. Nothing has changed in 700 years. Now, I want you to look again at this image. Because this guy down on the right-hand side here is fast asleep, and I don't think there's anyone in this room who has ever avoided the problem of boredom while attending lectures or conferences. Sometimes I have had pains in my chest from boredom because of this medieval pedagogy. If you look really carefully at this image, you'll find that there's not a single person in the room listening to the lecturer. Have a scan around here. In fact, the guy in green, the second row at the back next to the window, looks as though he's on his Blackberry. And if you lecture, you'll have seen that behavior amongst your own students, I'm sure. Now, something very interesting happened in the history of technology and education, because really this is still going on today. There are thousands of people lecturing as we speak. I'm doing it now. But something very interesting happened in 1785 in my hometown in Edinburgh, in Scotland, and a guy called James Pillians invented the blackboard. And that swept through education, and this was a disaster because it completely overnight swept away the whole notion of that Socratic interaction with students. What teachers and lecturers started to do was stand back. And if any of you have degrees in mathematics or physics, you will know and be familiar with the process of the lecturer stand 
sitting here on a chalkboard and writing for 50 minutes with his back to the audience. This is acceptable pedagogy. The blackboard wasn't a great piece of technology. It sort of destroyed active learning between teachers. Teachers started to talk at people. And let me illustrate this by a fun example. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, a tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs, in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Voodoo economics. Anyone know the name of that film? Ferris Bueller. Excellent. That guy was a trained teacher, even though he was an actor, and he absolutely nails it. The blackboard behind him, that drone, surely you've seen that. There are thousands of children who are experiencing that right now. It, yeah, I do indeed, yeah. It's, and it's a caricature because there are good teachers out there. There are people who really can do this well. Nevertheless, the weakness of the lecture as a pedagogical device has been around for a long time. The research is clear. We only have lectures because the Babylonians had a sexadecibel number system. That's the only reason they are an hour long. It's got nothing to do with the psychology of learning. And we know with absolute certainty that attention drops off quite quickly, as does note-taking, as does the performance of the lecturer. But we still persevere with this core pedagogy. It's still the core pedagogy in higher education, long-form essays being the next one. I'd then like to put a hypothesis to you, which is that in the last 10 years, there's been more pedagogic change than in the last 1,000 years or 10,000 years. The last 10 years have been absolutely astounding in terms of how learners learn as opposed to how teachers teach. If we look at this list here, Napster, Moodle, iTunes, Wikipedia, Blogger, WordPress, Facebook, LinkedIn, Flickr, Twitter, you name it, everything that we and kids use every hour of their lives has sprung into life in the last decade. Do we use any of these things in education? Sometimes, not often. Another thing that happened in the last decade, last year I spent a lot of time doing a big research project out at Qatar on the Arab Spring and the role of technology in the Arab Spring. And believe me, it was a necessary condition for success that social media existed first in Tunisia, then in Egypt, then less so differently in Libya for the Arab Spring to have succeeded. And if social media can succeed in toppling dictatorships, do we still think it has no role in education? How do you think these kids did this? But there are problems, real problems. In Southern Europe at the moment, in Greece, 55% unemployment. In Spain, 53% youth unemployment. Similarly, in Italy, in Portugal, spreading up into the UK, massive graduate employment is on the way. Who caused the financial crisis? Interestingly, I think most people put some blame on bankers. The very graduates that came out of our top business schools so is the system really working? Are we in serious trouble, as Dr. Chan said, and why? Maybe the existing system isn't that hot. Maybe education for everybody in the same old way has caused as many problems as solutions. Because graduates are queuing up for jobs now. And if you look at some of these graphs now, the cost of education, the top line, this is US data, I should add, has way outperformed uh, the rise in the cost of homes, the rise in 
in the consumer price index. So things are spiraling a bit out of control here. And indeed, the total debt in education in the US has now transcended that of credit cards, the trillion dollar problem. And people like Peter Thiel, who predicted the financial crisis, I invest on PayPal and Facebook, by the way, claims it's a bubble. He said it has the two big hallmarks of a bubble higher education. The first is that the price goes up, but the offer stays the same. So your house is exactly the same house, but the prices go up. That's a bubble, folks. And the second thing is that you shouldn't question it. It's like if you question the assumptions in higher education, it's like questioning Santa Claus. That's another sign of a bubble. Everybody just buys into growth, growth, growth and everything. Nothing changes. But the unemployment figures, the real data tells a story, which is having a degree no longer means having a good job. It may no longer mean having enough money even to pay for the debt that you put forward for that degree. We know this is true. We know in our hearts that this is on the table now. Now let me turn to pedagogy for a minute, because it's still patently absurd that we don't even record lectures. Never mind delivering them. Now, if I were a journalist, for example, I would never in a million years write my article and say, I'm going to read it once. I'm not going to publish it in a newspaper. Oh, no. Or if I were a novelist, I wouldn't write a novel and say, listen, guys, I'm not going to publish it in a book. <laughs> but that's what lecturers do. That once-only delivery, despite the fact that everything, everything in the psychology of learning tells us that one bite of the cherry for students is not enough. Everything about memory tells us that repeated access to content, practice, rehearsal, shunts stuff from short to long term memory. And yet we still give this one bite of the cherry delivery. We know that kids love recorded lectures when you lay them down. In the Physics Institute that I've worked at in Trieste, they watch 13 hours of physics lectures a week. And they do that because for some of them, English is a second language. For some of them, they get ill, they miss the lectures, they use them for revision. Sometimes they cannot literally read the handwriting of the lecture on the chalkboard invented by that Scotsman. There are some very good practical reasons for doing this, quite apart from the fact that attainment dog-legged as soon as they started recording lectures. So it does result in real gains in attainment. And here's an interesting line. Just read this for a moment. Recording can improve a bad talk or lecture. How can recording a lecture improve a lecture? Well, if you lecture, you will know, as well as me, that you pad it out to the hour. Students are smart. They know that your introduction's probably a bit of padding. Your jokes are a bit of padding. There's a bit of padding at the end. And they tend, on average, to watch between 60 and 70% of the lecture. So it's far more efficient to record the lecture and let the students decide the relevant stuff. They fast forward. They can also, of course, rewind and repeat. But that was just the start. Recording lectures is really just taking a bad pedagogy and putting it online. The real move in education came with open educational resources. You're familiar with all this stuff, but believe me, if you've had to wade through YouTube EDU or iTunes U, you will quickly realize how poor lectures are. If you spent hours on iTunes U looking at lectures from some of our most uh, prodigious universities, people at the University of Berkeley, their psychology series is absolutely unwatchable. <laughs> it literally is unwatchable. And do you use those lectures? No, because it's bad stuff online. And this, universities across the globe when Second Life came out started putting lectures on Second Life. Remember all that stuff with the guys typing in the air? And suddenly you went to these places, if you ever went in Second Life, and it was the most boring, empty room in the planet. There was the lecturer and his two mates. You know, just because something exists in the real world doesn't mean to say you should replicate it in the online world. That's not how it works. And this is all gone. A complete waste of money and time. Then something happened in 2005, uh, 2006. Mr. Can who had a problem. He had a couple of nephews in another part of the States. He wanted to teach them maths. I, had the same, I, I was doing exactly the same in England. My, my relatives were in Scotland, and I was teaching them using Skype. And we found that was useful, actually, distance between you and the kids. The online teaching was better than over the shoulder. If you've ever had to teach a 14-year-old boy mathematics who doesn't want to learn mathematics, you'll know how awkward that is. You're not on the same planet as that kid. 
And this changed the world because he introduced the short video. YouTube really revolutionized the pedagogy. The first big, massive, open online pedagogy was short videos. Every 12-year-old can tell you that a video should not be an hour long. It should be as long as it needs to be for the task. And there have been 257 million of these videos viewed. Think of the scalability of that number. There are 4,000 freely avail available on YouTube. Then along came MOOCs. Let's turn to MOOCs for a minute. It's got to happen today, hasn't it? What's a MOOC? Well, we know massive open online course, but that ain't enough really. In a sense, there's nothing new about MOOCs. Anybody who's been involved in the MOOC world, I'm involved in two big MOOC projects, know that people have been doing this for a long, long time, actually. They've just been doing it internally, didn't call it MOOCs. The change is that they're out there, public, and they're free. That's the change. And I welcome that. But it's still really just at the cutting edge, as I say, of tradition here. You know, there's no new pedagogy here. Almost everything in a MOOC, whether it's the peer learning, the short videos, the forms of assessment have already been done. They were already been completed in other contexts. And don't imagine that all MOOCs are created equal or that they even resemble each other, some of these MOOCs. If you look at this taxonomy of MOOCs here, we have the transfer MOOCs which are a bit like taking your old course and just decanting it into the online world. That's what Coursera courses are, by and large. That's okay. The made MOOC, Udacity is a bit stronger because they demand quality in the videos. They have a more consistent approach to pedagogy, completely different in a sense. Then we have the synchronous MOOCs, where you have to start on a certain day, you have to put your homework and assignments in and deadlines, and you all end at the same time. As opposed to the asynchronous MOOCs, well, you can start any time, open assignment times, take as long as you want. That's what the web promised. That's what asynchronous MOOCs do. Then a really interesting one, the adaptive MOOCs. Because the real problem with MOOCs is replicating that feeling that the student needs that there's a tutor in charge, that there is a human being who really knows what they're doing behind all this. That's really tough. And when you have massive numbers, it's even tougher. The adaptive MOOCs use very smart back-end algorithms, in a sense to mimic this, gather really detailed data about you as a learner, and give feedback like a sat-nav would give you if you were going off-road to get you back on the learning path again. And the Gates Foundation, I was in Texas a month ago, have put this right at the top of their agenda in terms of funding. They think this is the solution to the problem, not just any old MOOC, certainly not the transfer MOOCs. And then you have the group MOOCs, uh, Novo Ed at Stanford again, of course, where you have small groups of five, six people with a mentor. The interesting thing about these MOOCs is that the MOOC which is out in the, uh, in the outside world for free is mimicked inside, so the courses will be run for students within Stanford as well as outside at the same time. I think that's an interesting model, as opposed to MOOCs being set free with no real sustainable model in terms of cash. And then we have the mini MOOCs, short courses. Most university courses, guys, are too long. That three-year drunken meander through a BA is no longer acceptable. We have to waken up to the fact that the agricultural calendar is no longer acceptable. And that's what MOOCs are doing. They're making us think about this again. What about assessment? A lot of MOOCs are about math, so I wonder why. Look at this question. Find X, Pythagoras' theorem. Smart kid, this. Here is X. Here it is, he says. I've run businesses all my life. Who would I rather employ, the kid who knew Pythagoras' theorem or the kid who was smart enough to say, here it is, who has some lateral thinking, some creativity, and who's really smart? Because most of the assessment in MOOCs is quite poor. And we do lots of maths MOOCs because it's a subject that's easy to test. However, peer learning does offer a real hope here because the research shows that peer learning and peer assessment and peer evaluation really does work. Let me quickly tell you why. It's massively scalable. The more students you have, the better peer learning is. And isn't that a weird thing? Imagine there's an academic saying, oh, I, I want 10,000 students in my lecture hall. Are you mad? But peer learning, peer software works if you have more students. Teaching, when students start to teach, they learn. It encourages critical thinking. Peers are closer to the problem. They understand the cognitive problems that other learners have in their age group. 
group bonding is a side effect and you get higher attainment. And I recommend that you look at Eric Mazur who teaches physics at Harvard and within a year had dog-legged attainment because he introduced some simple peer assessment in his lectures. It was as simple as that. And of course we have a research paper here if you're interested which uh, I think shows similar effects. And we've been doing this stuff for ages. MOOCs are not new with regard to peer assessment. We have been doing this stuff for years, over 10 years. What about dropout? I think it's a complete category mistake to worry about dropout. It's not what MOOCs are about. You know, it's an old term. He dropped out of university. We have high school dropouts. You We're can't take that language in the, uh, and apply it in the, in, in the MOOC world. Let me go f quickly through this now. Because the big problem here is it's easy to wire places. The tough bit, which is why MOOCs are making us think, is harder to wise people. And that's why Cotter has created the schema, eight steps on change management. Number one is create a sense of urgency. And that's exactly what MOOCs have done. We're all thinking about what we're gonna do now because of MOOCs. So grab this opportunity to think again about what you're doing in your institution because Pedagogy is no longer coming from education departments and universities. Pedagogy is coming from these guys. Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web, Open Educational Resources from Torvalds. The, the MOOC guys down in the bottom uh, side here, we've got CAN, we've got YouTube, we've got all the people who gave us that wondrous gift of the web and the tools which every learner and every academic on the planet uses in anger and resistance is futile. Thanks very much for listening. We now have a, a few minutes for questions, and I think Donald's given us a challenge. He's, he's shown us uh, uh, a series of technologies and a wave of what's happening in online education, and uh, also within pedagogy, and how can we and think about what can we do to implement change by facilitating the assembly of these new technologies into a better education and making it more rich for our students and more enjoyable. So I think, uh, Donald, again, thank you very much. Very challenging. So do we have any, any questions? Yes. It's an interesting question for me because I'm a technologist by background, but I'm a bit suspicious about shunting technology into classrooms. And the reason for that is this, you know, mantra, keep, taping the, keep taking the tablets, you know, give every kid a tablet. I like to see teachers, I was a school governor for four years in England. I like to see teachers teach in classrooms. That box was designed for a one-to-many teaching experience. And interestingly, some of the early research that's coming out in tablets shows that because it's difficult to type on a tablet, Kids are not writing long sentences, not using sophisticated vocabulary. It's actually sometimes inhibiting learning. And to be honest, I prefer the flipped model. Kids use technology outside the context of the classroom. If you start pouring technology into that room, the teacher is in trouble from word go. Getting them all to switch it on. Have you ever tried to switch on a notebook? It takes about 30 seconds to a minute. They're all going at different load up times. Malaysia have done a very interesting thing here, I should add, which I applaud, which is by, there's a big Chromebook project here, which has just been announced by Google, an eight second boot up, straight to the cloud, so all your data's up there. If the kid smashes the machine, it doesn't matter, all the data's still up there. I think there's some wisdom in that. But don't necessarily just give them all a tablet or a notebook in the classroom so the teacher's speaking to them, but they're looking at the screen. There's something inherently weird about that. You know, I don't know if that answers that question. So I'd rather not blur it. I'd like to keep the classroom I'd, I'd rather have less classroom, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly.
it is, yeah. There was one here. Okay, I think there are two big lessons from Khan Academy. One is get the stuff online, keep the videos short. But the interesting thing about Khan Academy videos is Khan doesn't appear. Now this may seem odd that the lecturer doesn't appear in any of the videos, but actually it makes perfect sense. If, you, if there are any psychologists here, you know that memory relies on really the two big forms of memory, there are lots of them, is episodic and semantic memory. If you're teaching mathematics, the last thing you want to do is have the face of the lecturer on your video, because that will appeal to episodic memory, not semantic memory. And Can instinctively, intuitively knew this and just did the, the drawing of the maths, so the kid would focus on the maths and not Can. That was the big breakthrough. The second one that most people don't realize about the Khan Academy is the real power of the Khan Academy is that in the back-end algorithms support the software that supports all this stuff. The badges system, the real detailed model it builds of a learner's progress and then decisions about what that learner needs as they go through their learning journey. That's where the smartness is in Khan. It's not really all about the front-end videos. So we have loads to learn from that, but we already have. Sebastian, most MOOCs have already really incorporated pedagogic lessons from CAN into their system. Sebastian Thrun famously as well, where you have his hand, and that's a top NDI course, the first one he launched. Udacity, by the way, I don't think will survive. I, I was involved, we went to Udacity with half a million dollars for a program, and they turned it down. One of the founders has just left last week. I have real doubts about Udacity surviving in the market, to be honest. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just a problem, you know. I IPR is just a business problem, <laughs> and it's a problem to be solved. But what you don't want to do is leave it messy. In universities, whenever we've dealt with this, you, first of all, you get that defensive, oh, it's my stuff, why should I give it to, you know, you can't, calm down, calm down. Nobody wants your stuff anyway, you're not going to sell it, you're not going to make any money on your course notes. Chill out a little bit, you know, this is about the learners, not you. And the universities should have this contractually sorted out anyway. It's a legal issue. Get the lawyers to handle it and move on. But it's a problem like security in IT. It's a problem to be overcome. And not, a, not, and not an excuse for doing nothing, which is what IP often is, I feel. All right. Thank you. Thank you.